the interior part of the curve of a river here. And this is where the river likes to deposit sand, debris, rocks, and big trees and logs. So this is where we'll find a nice kind of, sometimes a beach area. And there you see a lot of seedlings sprouting up in it. Right here, some water actually sits sometimes. And you can see all the tracks I got the, got the rock hounds with today. And I've been digging in this wet sand here. And what's interesting is, if you see, that's kind of the top of the wet sand. This little dog track there. And if we start digging underneath it, we start seeing it's a lot darker under the surface. And what we're looking at is plant matter. This is broken down plant debris, logs. That you're seeing the process of them breaking down. Nice organic, rich stuff there. If this sits around long enough, it will become something else. In order to find out what this stuff will turn into in the future, we need to travel back into the past, many, many millions of years into the past. And we can do this by looking at existing rock layers, tall sedimentary units that are layered with shales, claystones, mudstones, sandstones, siltstones, and in them, we also find seams of a dark black substance. Coal. This is the result of many, many millions of years of the compaction of plant debris, like that stuff we were playing with on the beach. Now, it obviously looks a little different than the plant matter that we were looking at, and that's because it's undergone a lot of physical and chemical changes uh, since it was first deposited. And over time, we get a little bit more of a compact, harder substance like this. And it doesn't obviously start out as coal. It starts out with the stuff we saw on the beach, and then it goes through a series of processes of different grades of coal. And coal is found in sedimentary rocks, most often in sedimentary layers or groups of formations that include rock types like sandstone, siltstone, and shales. Take, for instance, the Mesa Verde group. This is actually a group of formations, each containing layers upon layers of those sedimentary rocks. Now consider, where would you expect to find coal in these types of units? Would it be in the sandstone layers, like the Cliffhouse sandstone or Point Lookout sandstone, which are marine origin near shore deposits? Or might it be in something like the Menifee Formation, which contains river floodplain and coastal swamp environments? And take a look at this image, which shows the stratigraphy, or relative order, of the rock units correlated with the types of ancient environments. Notice in the lithology key that the shaded black box represents coal. And in the graphic, that correlates with, you guessed it, swamps. That's right, coal is formed in coastal and inland swamp environments. And while nearby environments like splays and marshes and lakes seem similar, they don't quite have the same physical and chemical properties of a swamp that make them conducive to coal formation. And that's why we find coal associated with these other types of sedimentary rocks, especially carbonaceous shales. These shales are great places to look for plant fossils. So clearly to find coal, we need to find ancient swamp environments. But first, Let's take a look at the different types of coal that can form. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So... Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. First step in coal formation is the development of peat, which is partially decayed plant matter found in those swamps. Now at this point, it's not coal yet. It accumulates in an anoxic environment, one that is low in oxygen where plant debris doesn't biodegrade. And if just enough heat and pressure is applied through the process of burial, we'll get coal. But there are different grades of coal. We're going to now talk about the three main types of coal, which include lignite, bituminous, and anthracite coal. Lignite coal, also referred to as brown coal, is formed when peat is exposed to a small amount of heat and pressure during burial. 
It is a flaky coal that produces low BTUs. It's considered to be smoky, and it's been used in power plants near mines or in drilling mud to prevent water loss. This is the lowest grade of coal. Bituminous coal is a soft black coal. It's highly compacted, and it has a cubic fracture and higher BTUs than that lignite. It's also less smoky and sometimes even smokeless. It has been used in steam electric power and in the process of steel making. Anthracite is the highest grade of coal, referred to as hard coal. It tends to store well, but it is brittle. It's a black, shiny luster, and it has this conchoidal fracturing. You might have also seen that in obsidian. It has a short smokeless flame, and it is the highest grade. It has undergone the highest amount of metamorphic pressures. The differences in these grades of coal is best seen in a graph like this that shows the chemical composition of these coal types. Notice that lignite has a higher amount of moisture, but as we move along through the grades, bituminous and anthracite coal have much less moisture. And meanwhile, the fixed carbon gets higher as we move through bituminous and anthracite grades. Also, volatile matter is less and less as we move from lignite to bituminous. And when we get to anthracite, volatile matter and moisture is extremely low. So where can we find those ancient swamps? Well, particularly notable are the coal swamps of the Carboniferous, but also earlier in the Permian and later on in the Mesozoic, we find notable widespread coal swamps. Some examples of global coal suppliers include China, the U.S., Venezuela, and Colombia. One of the largest coal mines in the world is found in Querejón, Colombia. In the United States, these various grades of coal can be found in several key regions. By looking at certain formations in places like Utah, Colorado, Montana, in the West, and certain places in the Eastern US as well. So let's take a look. The Eastern and Gulf provinces, especially Appalachia in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, also in the interior province, regions around Missouri, Iowa, and especially Illinois, and the Rocky Mountain and Great Plains provinces, especially in regions around Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and the Dakotas. The top coal producing states include Kentucky, Illinois, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Wyoming. The largest coal deposit by volume is in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and parts of Montana. The USGS estimated to have 1.07 trillion short tons of in-place coal resources there, or 162 billion short tons of recoverable coal, and 25 billion short tons of economic coal resource, also called reserves. This was done in 2013. The coal in the Powder River Basin is considered sub-bituminous in grade. These coals found in the Rocky Mountain province, including formations in Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana, are of Mesozoic age, especially Cretaceous age, like the stuff in that Mesa Verde group. Meanwhile in Utah, there also is some coal in the Wasatch Formation, which is still younger, being Eocene aged. Another key coal region is in the Williston Basin in North Dakota and Montana. This is lignite ranking coal. In contrast, the coals found in the Appalachian Basin in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, and all the way down to Alabama are actually much older. These are Paleozoic coals, and these come from very ancient swamps, like the ones you think of in the Carboniferous, like the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian. These coals are bituminous in rank. Paleozoic coals can also be found in the Illinois Basin in places like Illinois and Indiana, and these coals are bituminous. For somewhat boring black rock, coal mining actually has a long and colorful history, but we'll save the dirty details for another video. Coal mining used to be primarily done by accessing the deeply buried coal seams through dark, deep, shafts and mine at it. But much of the world's coal mining has now shifted to new methods called surface mining or accessing it via strip mines. They literally take off the top of a mountain to get to the coal seam. Coal's main usage throughout history has been for heating and for electricity for people and businesses. In coal-fired power plants, Coal is burnt to make steam, and the steam turns turbines, the machines for generating the mechanical power, which generates electricity. 
Many industries have their own power plants and use coal to generate electricity for their business use, mostly in combined heat and power plants. In 2022, coal accounted for almost 20% of U.S. electricity generation. Now, it's these key parts of the mining and usage of coal that lead to what I call the coal controversy. The three main issues with coal center around mining safety and the environmental impacts of mining coal, as well as the environmental impacts of burning coal. As an example, still to this day, one of the worst mining disasters in American history is the Monongo, West Virginia mining disaster. It happened in 1907 when mines 6 and 8 of the Monongo mine suffered a devastating explosion. The explosion destroyed much of the mine as well as the surface, and it killed most of the miners instantly and trapped those who remained behind, making rescue attempts difficult and dangerous. Not all disasters were just in the early 1900s. In November 1968, a catastrophic explosion rocked the number nine coal mine in Farmington, West Virginia as well. This history is what's led us to use the phrase the canary in the coal mine when talking about some impending doom or bad prophecy. They even had these resuscitation cages with oxygen to revive a canary who was being used to detect carbon monoxide pockets in the mine. The change in these coal mining techniques to more strip mining may have reduced some of the historical risks, but it also introduced some environmental problems. The stripping away of whole mountaintops obviously comes along with more widespread damage to the environment. In 2022 in the United States, Surface mines, or strip mines, were the source of about 63% of the coal mined in the U.S. In the Appalachian region, mountaintop removal and valley fill mining has impacted large areas of land in West Virginia and Kentucky. One of the most harmful environmental aspects of strip mining is that when the mountaintops are exploded and removed, the dirt and rock tends to fill in the surrounding streams, and the water draining from the filled-in valleys may also contain pollutants, and this is all harmful to the aquatic wildlife downstream. The final issue with coal that's been burning more recently is the burning of coal. Coal is used for electricity generation, especially by various industries, and this accounts for 20% of the electricity generation in the United States. But for decades, scientists have pointed out the possible impacts to the atmosphere of burning coal. Graphs like this one from NOAA, which includes data from ice cores, shows that carbon dioxide levels in recent history has skyrocketed. And plenty of this carbon dioxide input is due to the burning of coal. This leads to a whole social and political debate that we don't have time for in today's video. But it does leave us with a burning question. Are the alternatives to coal really better? I'll at least point out this interesting research done by Thomas Trozak called Why Do We Burn Coal in Trees to Make Solar Panels? In it, he points out that the things needed to make solar panels, like cell and module factories, are all running on grids powered mostly by fossil fuels and uranium. And he points out that much of this around the world is generated through the burning of coal which might make the distinction between our energy sources, that is, coal versus renewables, a little blurry. I hope you enjoyed today's overview of coal. A lot of things that I had to leave out for the sake of time. I'll be doing some more videos about coal and related resources and mining. There are some things that people often get confused with coal, such as what is the difference between coal and coal tar, oil shale oil, gilsonite, bitumen, creosote, charcoal. We'll be talking about that in upcoming videos here at Let's Go Geo. So there you have it, coal. Stay tuned because I'll be talking about other related natural resources like oil and gas, which are also found in proximity to some of the coal seams we talked about here today. I also have a full length video on sedimentary rocks. So if you're just getting started and you want kind of a geology 101 uh, on sedimentary rocks or other rocks, go to the rocks playlist and you'll find that there. And I also have an overview of minerals and all kinds of things related to geology here at Let's Go Geo. So hopefully you'll join me on the next adventure. If you'd like to support the cause and help me, I'm a one woman team 
doing uh, this geology channel. So you can do that by becoming a fan on Patreon and get access to exclusive content there. And you can join me on Facebook if you're on Facebook and you can see some of the updates on Let's Go Geo there as well. Otherwise, I'll see you here on the next adventure at Let's Go Geo. Thank <music> you.